What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review for Diablo 4, a game I was looking forward to this year that wound up blending a lot of elements from both Diablo 2 II and 3 into something that feels relatively fresh and unique, even if it doesn't exactly drive any innovation. But before we dive into that, while I usually review games after 100% to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform, that's obviously not the case here today, as this sort of game with it being in many ways a live service game as it is online only and is going to receive seasons and things that change up the gameplay alongside the talk of expansions that are already being planned. It doesn't exactly fit into my normal content approach, so I'm doing something a little more standard even if many of my own approaches still apply. And to give a little bit of background to that, in this particular game, I've been playing it since its early access launch. I've put in roughly 60, 70 hours. I didn't really keep count. I've brought one character, my main character, the Druid, all the way to the end game World Tier 4, running Nightmare Dungeons, etc. And if you're curious about the build I wound up using for that, it is the one that I posted just a couple of days ago. Though in addition to that, I also took a look at a few other classes and basically just tried to do everything the game had to offer before this review. That said, to start this off, as with many games that are brand new, I like to talk about the technical state of them right here at the beginning. In the case of Diablo 4, probably the most important thing to note is that it is online only. There is no offline mode, and while I personally think that is an unfortunate decision, the online experience that we are working with has been mostly problem-free. There have been some minor issues, but most of them are just that minor. The launch has been largely smooth. I personally only had to wait in a queue once for about four minutes, despite playing as much as I did, though it is my understanding that other people had more substantial issues for periods of time where they just couldn't log in. And beyond connection issues, the actual state of the game is pretty positive. There really wasn't too much in the way of problems there outside of minor bugs usually related to server connections. Tiny bits of lag in relation to other players in the world, making up the bulk of it. However, I did run into a few substantial problems that I think are noteworthy. Every once in a while when I would teleport to a new area, everything interaction-wise would stop working. I could no longer skip cutscenes, I could no longer activate abilities, etc. And the only thing that would fix that is simply logging out and logging back in. And then another issue I ran into is that every once in a while when loading into a dungeon, it would actually spawn me in farther than it should. That is to say, I would be put in an inaccessible portion of the later part of the dungeon as opposed to the beginning of it, which will actually make a few dungeons simply unable to be completed, which is kind of annoying. However, barring those problems, which were pretty easily fixed, and the obvious server connection issues that come with an online game, and the state of this one is pretty positive. And after a string of sort of disastrous AAA launches here in the, just the last few months even, a launch with relative relatively minor issues I think is easily hand-waved away, at least by comparison. Next up, I want to talk about the game's difficulty a little bit. The game uses a scaling difficulty across four different world tiers. Tiers 1 and 2 are available right away, Adventurer and Veteran. These are sort of the standard difficulties, and while much of the world will scale to you, these are determining monster strength in relation to you. However, in the case of both World Tier 1 and 2, the worlds kind of stop scaling to you after about level 50 outside of a few instances. This is when the game pushes you to advance onto the later world tiers. This requires you to complete a special dungeon on the highest available difficulty to unlock the next one. In the case of our first advancement going to nightmare mode, we need to have beaten both the campaign as well as the capstone dungeon, it is called, on veteran tier. Once we unlock nightmare tier in order to unlock torment, we have to complete the capstone dungeon there, which while technically available right away, has a lower limit on monster levels of 70, meaning that most people won't be completing this in until around low to mid 60s, depending on your build exactly, at which point you'll unlock the final tier. Now, both World Tiers 3 and 4 also bring us enhanced loot, which is pretty standard for ARPGs, but in the case of Diablo 4, 
This means unique as well as higher item tiers. On Nightmare, we can start picking up sacred items, and on Torment, we can start picking up ancestral items. These are basically just higher item level versions of the things you've already been picking up, which is similar to what Diablo 2 did. In addition to this, these higher tiers can also come in the form of uniques, which are, in fact, unique items based on the type of item as well as the tier of which that you found. And because of that, both Nightmare and Torment bring new unique items to play around with, as well as just better quality gear in general on top of increased experience to help streamline the leveling process. But as we go up those tiers, enemies also start becoming more difficult, obviously, but also they start penetrating our own resistances, which can make them even more difficult to deal with. But eventually, once you get to a good place, you'll be fine. And combine that with this game's open world nature, that's probably a little easier here than it was in the game that used an incredibly similar system, which was Diablo 2. Their normal nightmare and hell mode available there was effectively exactly like this. And naturally, as I'm a big fan of Diablo 2, I enjoy the way this system was implemented. I like that they have you complete a capstone dungeon before moving on, which will kind of make sure you're ready for the next set of challenges. And because of the way they've handled the scaling, where it sort of stops at its intended level, means that eventually you'll sort of overlevel the content you're currently working on and be push to trying on a new challenge and moving up to the next tier. That brings us to the story of Diablo 4, though, and it is, for the most part, pretty good. It follows, of course, the Diablo storyline after the conclusion of Diablo 3 and its Reaper of Souls expansion. This means that the World of Sanctuary is in a rather bleak place before things even get started. Much of the population was decimated as a consequence of Reaper of Souls, and that's just one of many recent cataclysmic events brought on by the eternal conflict or the fight between heaven and hell. However, even in these times, we see the demon known as Lilith summoned into the world, which is important because Lilith and an angel Anarius are the ones who created the world in an attempt to escape the eternal conflict. Lilith, having been summoned back into it after being banished by Anarius, almost immediately starts setting plans into motion in what she claims is a bid to defend Sanctuary. Our character, whoever you happen to decide to play as, which we'll talk about in just a moment, winds up forming a small bond with Lilith that allows us to track her across the land and try to prevent this from happening after some events in the prologue are set in motion. And while I don't really want to spoil anything, obviously, I will say this about the story. Broadly speaking, I thought it was very good. The beginning and the ending are very strong. However, I would say of the six acts that make up the game, four and five are kind of weak. Five more so than any of the others. Five very much so feels like filler. You could have cut a lot of that out and it would not have made a difference. However, I do think they did a good job of making an interesting Diablo story in spite of the events of 3 and its expansion, and they leave this one with some room to maneuver, which is rather obvious given that they've already stated they're working on two expansions for this. And I'll admit, as somebody who loves Diablo, I'm curious where they're going from here. Outside of that really weak chapter 5, I had a lot of fun with the story. And seeing how the story will mostly take you all the way up to level 50 and potentially into nightmare mode to meet the end game, it does a nice job of leading you right into everything else the game has to offer, which I think is about as much as you can ask for a game like this, as ARPGs aren't exactly known for their stellar stories. From there, though, let's talk about the classes. Now, I will spare you a full mechanical breakdown of all five of these, but simply put, we can play as the Druid, Necromancer, Barbarian, Sorcerer, or Rogue. Now, for the most part, these are what you would expect. Barbarian, Sorcerer, and Necromancer are in most Diablo games at this point, so you pretty much know what to expect there. Very much so true to their class fantasy. The Druid sees its return from Diablo 2 with many of those core systems intact, which gives us a huge focus on either shape-shifting or using elemental magic. And as someone whose favorite class in Diablo 2 was a druid, naturally that's where I started personally. Lastly, we have the Rogue. The Rogue is a bit of a spin on the Assassin class from Diablo 2. It's not exactly the same, but it's relatively similar. But either way, it is our light, dexterous character that can fulfill a variety of roles thanks to its very adaptable set of skills. Well, that's pretty cool in and of itself. What I actually really enjoy about the classes and the thing I wanted to talk about in this review is their unique class mechanics. Each one of these classes gets to do something that is unique to them beyond just their skills, which really helps sell their class fantasy. In the druid's case, this means making 
spirit offerings to various spirits, which will then grant you boons, which are some pretty powerful passive buffs for you. The Barbarian uses the Arsenal system, which is to say they can equip multiple types of weapons at once. The Sorceress gets the Enchantment system, where they can equip some of their spells as passive abilities, which can provide a variety of benefits. The Necromancer gets the Book of the Dead, allowing them to customize how they summon their undead enemies or choose to take a passive instead. Then we have the rogue, who can do things like learn how to utilize combo points to benefit their abilities, but overall a very cool set of systems that really help this classes stand out in addition to their already distinct flavor. That said though, I would say it's almost certain we'll see the addition of more classes later, probably with the expansions. That brings us to the various progression systems of Diablo 4 though, and this is an area of the game that is sort of all-encompassing. The interesting thing about Diablo 4 is that a lot of the game is a sort of intricately layered system of progression, some of which is account-wide, some of which is character-specific, but almost everything you do in this game is progressing something. Now, at a most base level, we have our character levels. We can level a character up to a maximum of 100. Up until level 50, they earn skill points. We spend these on our various skills to create our build. These can be refunded individually or reset all at once, which will help you play around with skills, which gets more expensive as you level up, but is never really that bad. But once we hit level 50, we start earning Paragon points instead, and we'll get four of these for every one level we make, with each point being 25% of that level. We get to spend Paragon points on our Paragon board, which is a relatively interesting system that is more engaging than I would say Diablo 3's iteration of this was, while also being highly customizable. Basically, we'll spend points to move along this board to make it to both magic and rare nodes, which have powerful, more interesting abilities to grant us typically passives, before reaching the board gate, which will allow us to attach another paragon board of our choosing based on our class. This is going to allow us to customize exactly how we're spending our paragon points, while also benefiting our class directly because things like legendary paragon nodes will have huge bonuses that can really mix up your playstyle. In addition to this, however, the Paragon boards also come with a Glyph Socket. Glyphs are a kind of thing we can pick up typically from running the in-game dungeons. These Glyphs can be socketed into the sockets to provide both a passive benefit and potentially a bonus benefit if enough nodes of the right type are taken within that Glyph's radius. I actually enjoy this quite a bit because it adds more value to the regular nodes that would otherwise not be very interesting because while I might have only just beelined it to the thing I actually wanted before, now I have a reason to pick these up because it might reward me with a more powerful bonus from a rare glyph socket. That said, the glyphs themselves can also be leveled up by running the various in-game nightmare dungeons, which will provide stronger benefits to the glyphs themselves. But we are really only just getting started here because out in the open world we can earn renown. Renown is essentially a meter of how many of the activities in a given zone you have done. The world is broken up into five distinct sections for us to play the game through, and each of those sections offers a variety of content to enjoy via the form of side quests, dungeons, altars of Lilith to be found, and many of the rewards for unlocking all of the renown are incredibly worthwhile. That said, you cannot fully unlock the renown rewards until you reach the the Nightmare World tier, but even before then, some of the renowned rewards include extra skill points, and then the later ones in the Nightmare tier can actually reward you extra Paragon points, but also things like extra potion uses. Most interestingly though, we have the Altars of Lilith. These are going to provide a small account-wide benefit. Also, the renowned rewards are account-wide, so your second character will be able to benefit from all those things immediately, which acts as a sort of built-in alt catch-up. Up, if you want to put it that way, with the Altars of Lilith in particular adding things like base stats, extra paragon points, higher capacity on certain currency maximums, which is our gambling currency, and other various things like that. But that's to say nothing of the game's other progression systems, like the most obvious one, our gear progression. As we level up and move through this ARPG, it's a bit of a loot extravaganza through which we'll constantly be changing out and upgrading gear, many of which has attached crafting systems to further augment said gear. That said, personally, I didn't really enjoy messing around with the crafting until I hit nightmare mode where it felt worthwhile and I was less likely 
likely to change out a perfectly crafted piece of gear, at least for a little while, whereas early in the game you're changing equipment so often that it's honestly just not worth the effort. But on top of just constantly finding gear that suits your build better, we can upgrade it via a blacksmith, which will add extra power levels to it, increasing the benefits on it. We can do this with jewelry as well. The jeweler can add sockets to various items, which will allow us to add gems to customize them further. The occultist will allow us to enchant an item or change out various specific magic abilities it has to suit our playstyle a little more or add legendary aspects to it. Legendary aspects are sort of the big, typically build-defining abilities that we can find on legendary gear. However, Diablo 4 allows us to extract those legendaries into aspects. We can then assign these to other pieces of rare gear to effectively make them legendary instead, so we can mix and match those unique powers so we don't rely on specific pieces of gear that might become outdated. And you don't even need to find legendary items to do this either, because through the Codex of Power, we can actually just learn how to make these right out of the gate. By completing various world dungeons, we can earn aspects, either for our class or others. Again, this is account-wide. So once we've unlocked them, we have them at which point we can just go to the occultist, say we want this item with this ability, and get it straight away. Which I think is a fantastic way to add some definitive progression to a system that would otherwise be based on chance. So if I need a specific ability, chances are I can just go get it, instead of waiting for other gear to drop. Now the exception to that are the uniques. As I explained earlier, these are unique items with set bonuses and are typically the best of the best in what they are trying to do. However, they tend to be very build specific specific, but most of these are what are going to comprise your in-game gear hunt. And while you can add sockets and upgrade a unique item, what you cannot do is adjust the stats in any way. So something to keep in mind. And believe it or not, we actually still have a few other systems I want to talk about, but we'll save those for the world section. The main thing I want to get across with the progressions portion of this video is simply that the progression systems are wide and far-reaching. They touch just about every aspect of the game, which means that no matter matter what you're doing or how you're playing this game, you are almost always progressing something. Be that grinding more levels for Paragon as you shoot for level 100, grinding nightmare dungeons to upgrade your glyphs, finding aspects out in the world, etc, etc. There's just so many ways to progress in this game. It always feels like you're right around the corner from another big upgrade, which I think really adds a lot to the gameplay loop and is going to keep people playing because the next thing is always kind of just a little bit further. But that does bring us to the world section of the video. As I've already mentioned, the game scales the world based on the world tier you are on, but the world itself is an open world, and while you are low level, some areas will be sort of locked off behind a minimum level. Once you get to a certain point, the open world is just that, open, and it's all going to scale to you up to the maximum of what that world tier is supposed to be, outside of a few specific pieces of content. So in the cases of world tier 1 and 2, where you start, the game kind of stops scaling to you after level 50. This is going to allow you to power up and push you into the next few world tiers. And as we move about and explore this open world, we're going to be doing so across five different regions, which makes for a relatively large open world map if you are on foot. However, after completing the first three acts of the story, which can be done in mostly any order, we can unlock a mount. The mount itself is customizable with various bits of gear, etc., but it's all pretty much cosmetic. This is going to allow us to get around faster, and while there are waypoints for us to unlock and immediately fast travel to from pretty much anywhere, our mount is going to help us traverse the open world a bit faster. And while our initial run of the open world is going to be doing things for renown, such as completing the side quests we can find, finding various altars, or just generally exploring and discovering locations. Once we get to world tiers 3 and 4, we get a few new progression systems or content to enjoy via the hell tides as well as the whispers. Helltide is an event that will encompass whole areas of the map where the area will run red with blood and summon higher level monsters to drop gear and a specific 
specific type of currency for that event, which can then be used to unlock various chests you'll find around, which can give you bigger and more upgraded gear. This is a great way to start leveling up and getting the new higher quality gear when you first step foot into a new world tier. Another thing that unlocks once you get to world tier 3 is the Whisper system. I can't explain too much of this without spoiling it, but I will say that basically this is a bounty system where we complete various bounties until we reach a minimum, at which point we can turn them in for a cache of rewards. But that is hardly the only thing to do. As I mentioned, there are side quests in this game, which is relatively unusual for an ARPG, and while most of them are very ARPG in nature, that is to say, go to this dungeon, kill all these enemies, go to this place, investigate something which leads to you killing all these enemies, etc. Some of these side quests are actually really interesting, some of them explore characters from previous games, or other interesting lore bits that make the world feel exactly like a world, like things are happening independently of you, even if that's not exactly true. While we're out exploring, we might also come across various types of ore or plants which can be gathered up and used as crafting materials for various things, typically our upgrading and crafting, as I talked about earlier, but this can also give us the ability to do things like upgrade our potion once we hit certain levels, allowing it to heal more and stay relevant, which adds just that little bit of purpose to the world exploration that I think is beneficial even if it's not necessarily a huge thing. But that does bring us to the combat section. Now, as you'll have been seeing on screen all throughout this review, combat is pretty standard ARPG stuff. As with much of this game, it is a blend of systems from both Diablo 2 and Diablo 3, with the game finding a sort of sweet middle spot of fast-paced action if you want it, but also a slower, more methodical take to avoiding certain hits from enemies, dodging at the appropriate time as we will only have so many dodges charges, as they are called, based on our gear. So saving those for the right time and moving out of the way of particularly big hits or just making sure you have an ability that will let you do that is a big part of combat. And in that way, it's a little bit more slow and methodical than, say, D3 was towards the end game, while still managing to get pretty hectic, especially if you group up large areas of monsters. And while no matter what class you're playing, you'll be dealing with a cooldown system on most of your various skills outside of a couple, which are typically your basic and core abilities, which are your generator and damage dealer, as most classes will be generating a resource with their main attacks, which they can then spend on various abilities, some with cooldowns, some are just simply their main damage dealing abilities, other abilities work solely off of cooldowns, so as you can see, again, bit of a mix between D2 and D3 here. But an interesting thing about combat is that for all of the various types of enemies we can fight, that is to say spiders, werewolves, vampires, skeletons, the usual assortment of creatures, every type of those creatures has sort of three different levels to them, that is to say minor, medium, or large, as I came to think of them. And that's important because the minor and the mediums are basically just fodder. You can kill them relatively quickly. However, the big version of every enemy typically has some sort of stun attack that you need to watch out for. And this is where positioning and making sure you have the ability to dodge those enemies is particularly important, especially when we get into the higher tiers of monsters known as elites. As with pretty much every ARPG, elites are special enemies that have special modifiers that are pulled from a pool that give them various unique magical abilities that can be a little more difficult to deal with, especially on higher difficulties where they're punching through your resistances. And then we can have our large boss fights, which tend to be a little more mechanical in nature. Oftentimes there are big specific attacks that you need to position yourself around with each portion of the boss's health ticking off potion drops, which will allow you to heal yourself a little more if that is something you're having an issue with against a particularly tough boss. Because while we can't heal ourselves in combat with a potion, it has a limited number of charges. In order to recharge it during combat, we have to pick up various health drops, which are these red orbs that drop. And while early on in the game you'll only have like four charges, late game you can have like nine to twelve, but even then you might burn through it quite a bit if you're trying to tackle particularly challenging dungeons. And while all of that is relatively straightforward and par for the course, where it gets a little more interesting is the nightmare dungeons. This is where they start bringing in maps with various modifiers, again kind of a hallmark of what ARPGs are, where we can run through these areas that have special modifiers to both the enemies or simply
simply special mechanics that we have to work around that make our job just a little bit harder. And all of that combined with a relatively decent amount of build diversity, especially when you start looking into customizing the Paragon boards and things like that the way you want as opposed to just following a guide. And I think you can have a lot of fun messing around with the combat and tweaking your build just so until you find something you like that really plays the game you want to play it. And because of that, I'd actually encourage you to move away from the build guides as the way this game is set up, you do not need to be doing absolute min-max damage all the time, which is a little more akin to Diablo 2's build system where if you were dedicated enough, most builds were in-game viable, even if it was rough getting there. But as with just about all of the rest of this game again, and as I've said several times, it combines elements of Diablo 2 and Diablo 3 to make something that is fresh and at the same time pretty engaging. Though it is a little more slow and methodical than Diablo 3 is, which I prefer personally. Now, as a bit of a criticism though, after all of that, I do think there are times where because of all the flashing, especially when you hit an enemy, it can be very difficult to discern where your character is if you get very swiftly outnumbered in the later parts of the game, which can make it especially difficult to get around those stunning enemies that I mentioned earlier, which can be a little bit of frustration. However, broadly speaking, I enjoy what they did with the combat here. Now, before we start to wrap this video up, I do think this is a prudent moment to talk about the microtransactions of this game. Now, simply put, I don't think they should be here. They are implemented in a way that does not particularly bother me, however, which means, to me, these aren't a huge deal as long as they are kept strictly cosmetic. But, in a full price game, I really don't think cosmetic microtransactions or any microtransactions at all should be here, especially when some of them cost like $25, which means at that point they're basically just transactions. Diablo 4 will allow you to buy Platinum, which is their in-game currency, to then spend on a cosmetic shop. As it stands, nothing pushes you to go purchase anything from this shop. There's like one tutorial message about where to go to pick up your items if you bought any, and that's about it. Beyond that, you have to go looking for the shop. It's also just purely cosmetic, and as a matter of personal preference, I think most of those cosmetics look worse than what is available in-game. So, while I find them very unobtrusive, at the same time, I still think they should not be here. In fact, it kind of reminds me of the Lord of the Rings Shadow of War game that launched with those pointless loot boxes that they eventually took out. So while yes, the game has microtransactions, they are cosmetic only, they are easily ignored, I also feel like they just shouldn't be there at all. And this is before we even start talking about the stuff to come, which is the season passes or the battle passes, once the game starts rolling out its seasonal content, which is going to be the long term. Now, the battle passes I do think have a little bit more of a leg to stand on as ultimately as this game has this sort of live service model and they're going to continue to support it, that dev time has to be financially viable. But given how Diablo and Blizzard have all been posting all over the internet about how this is their fastest selling game of all time makes even arguments like that a little bit of a moot point. So broadly speaking, I don't like the microtransactions. I don't think they should be here. They're ridiculous. They're expensive. They're only only purpose is to try to get more money out of people who have already paid a rather expensive price for this game. And what's more, it is my personal opinion that these microtransactions are probably the reason we don't have an offline mode, because realistically, how could they push you to buy these microtransactions at all if you have no reason to ever because you're offline? But overall, as long as they keep it cosmetic, I really don't think it's that big of a deal, even if I would really like that offline mode. That said though, as I mentioned in my impressions video, a few weeks before the early access launch of Diablo 4, I was contacted about potentially doing a sponsorship for the game that I turned down due to very just odd restrictions around my ability to respond to my own comments, mentioning other ARPGs outside of that video. And it was just a lot of just very strange restrictions which prompted me to turn it down. And when I asked for a review copy instead, they turned that down. And I tell you that because that bit of information combined with the weird situation around the microtransactions are very weird things to do when you could have just let this game speak for itself. Because as we're about to get to, this game is very good. And while it doesn't exactly innovate, it does a ton of things right and very well. Which means that it would have been incredibly easy to win a lot of goodwill by simply not having these microtransactions and not doing the battle passes. 
And given that the way they're implemented, I have a feeling that the developers probably feel the same way, as you can tell a lot of love went into this game otherwise. So everything around the monetization of this game past the initial purchase price to me reeks of corporate greed where it really doesn't need to be. All of that brings us to our positives and negatives. Now, on the positive side of things, Diablo 4 is a refinement of existing systems that we've seen Blizzard playing around with for a while via Diablo 2 Resurrected and Diablo 3 and some of its later seasonal content even, but especially just post-Reaper of Souls, basically. And they combined a lot of those elements to create a gameplay loop as well as progression systems that are incredibly compelling and fun to engage with. And I can honestly say this is probably the most fun I've had with an ARPG, of which I've played many, since Diablo 2, which is still installed on my computer to this day. So in that way, I think Diablo 4 does a great job of living up to its namesake. Which means that most of my negatives for this game are pretty much just personal gripes. I really think there should have been an offline mode for all sorts of reasons, such as server connection issues, games preservation, there's a million reasons to have that offline mode. And then we have all the microtransactions, which are probably the reason we don't have that offline mode, which is further highlighted by the fact that most of the problems the game does have in terms of its performance seem to be server-related issues. And if I had to guess, this game's biggest problems in the long run are likely simply to be the fact that it is, as an always online game, going to have to be striving for balance, especially with the PvP modes, which I didn't really talk too much about, but basically there's PvP zones. And because those things exist, they're always going to be trying to strike some sort of balance between various classes and adjust them to feel well, and I think a lot of that is going to be continuous and ongoing in order to sort of serve that online-only portion of the game. And that, more than really anything else the game does, is what makes it feel a little more like an MMO in nature, even though none of the other content really supports that at all. As while well, you can do things in groups and run around that way, and there are world bosses even, you can still pretty much play everything this game has to do on your own, just like a classic ARPG, really, which I think is going to lead to some interesting, I would say, situations moving forward. But all of that does finally bring us to our conclusion. My conclusion for Diablo 4 is this. It is a very good ARPG. It combines systems from Diablo 2 and 3 to make something fun, compelling, engaging. It does a lot of things right. Most of its problems are in incredibly minor in nature, and my main hang-up for this game is simply that the microtransaction shouldn't be there, I would love an offline mode, and from there we have to think about how this game is going to be moving forward. And that ultimately means that for the game's base asking price, which is $70, it's definitely worth it. I do think the Ultimate Edition, which is $100, is ridiculous, full of cosmetic nonsense, as well as an upcoming seasonal battle pass. However, in spite of that recommendation and an otherwise great game, all of that could be ruined in an instant by them simply adding anything that is remotely pay to win to their microtransaction store. And because of Blizzard's penchant for doing that previously, I have to make this statement, which is that while I would recommend you buy it right now in its current state, the second they add anything pay to win or anything remotely like that that ruins the otherwise pretty great experience, then it would sadly be become a game that I would not recommend. But as it stands, it's a lot of fun. I do think it's worth the asking price, and hopefully they don't mess that up. But that is going to do it for this video. That's everything I've got to say on the matter. I certainly hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.